I think that it sort of reiterates, doesn't it, that wherever you're from, people have a connection to food that can be, yeah, that's really sort of powerful and gives you an identity, um, but also can change and shift as people move around the world. Hello and a very warm welcome to Breaking Bread, the Birmingham-based food and drink podcast presented by Food Obsessed Mates, Liam and Carl. I'm Liam and we have a very special episode for you all today. It's one of them episodes where we finished recording and we both kind of sat and looked at each other and <sighs> took a massive sigh because I think we both kind of realised that what we just kind of recorded was something amazing. I think we both say all the time it's definitely one of our favourite episodes that we recorded. We kind of recorded it a little while back but we've held it back really Um I'll explain why now in just a minute. For this episode, we met Rosie and Lini from King's Heath and Bearwood Action for Refugees. Action for Refugees is a network of local community groups who are committed to supporting refugees and asylum seekers. They do some amazing things and I'm very, very proud to be able to share their story and bring some attention onto what they do. Action for Refugees actually came to our attention because they've got a a little cookbook. It's called This Cookbook Belongs to Us. It's a collection of recipes and stories from all different uh, nationalities who have came and settled in Birmingham. There's a variety of recipes on there. We've tried a couple and all of them are, are quite accessible, quite easy to do. There's not like a thousand ingredients or nothing. There's some home cooked favorites to some kind of show-stopping restaurant quality meals shared by some of the local restaurants in Birmingham. Now I've got a little bit of a favour to ask. We don't really ask uh, you, our amazing listeners, for much, but we kind of are today. We're releasing this episode I think two, three weeks before Christmas. We've kind of held it, we recorded it maybe a couple of months ago but we've purposely held it back till now because we were thinking it would be a good time to release so that you might hear this and absolutely love their story just like we did and get inspired to help them and actually there's a couple of ways that you can help them you can buy their the cookbook this cookbook belongs to us as i just mentioned you could go and buy that it's only £12.50, so it would make a nice little kind of stocking filler for someone. The link to buy that is on our show notes, and it's on our extended show notes, which can be found at breakingbreadpodcastuk.blog. All proceeds from the book uh, actually go to charity, which is nice. Um, there's a few other things on their shop as well, if you have a look around. They've got some nice t-shirts and bits like that some bits and bobs yeah so go and have a look at their shop and support them that way Uh, on top of that just maybe i think it was last week or the week before they actually released a new t-shirt collab with the amazing punks and chances who obviously we love if you just have a little look at our photo that's the t-shirts we've got on the no bab yes bab They do amazing things and then obviously they've collabed here with Action for Refugees and they've got a nice green t-shirt and and it says you're welcome Bab. So you can go and buy that as well if you get the link for that's also on these show notes or on our extended show notes. So go and take a look at that. Obviously all money from all profits from the t-shirt go to Action for Refugees as well so there's two great ways that you can help them there. So if you do want to support this charity, there's two brilliant ways. And a third way you could support the charity would be, and this is absolutely free, this won't cost you a thing. If If you love the podcast, you love the charity, and you want to help, you can recommend this episode of the podcast to someone you know who might be interested or might love it as well. 
and they might listen and hear this and then think oh yeah i'll go and buy a t-shirt or a book as well so obviously that will support the charity as well so yeah as i said i'm I'm very just very proud really of this episode i think it come across very well we actually recorded it from the prince of wales in mosley so massive thank you to them for letting us record there it was kind of a last minute kind of thing we got let down somewhere else and fair play to the prince of mosley they stepped up and let us record so thanks to them and yeah that's probably enough of me i do tend to kind of ramble yeah i just really hope you enjoy this and i hope you find it as brilliant as kind of we do like i even listening back while i was editing it it was just great i mean i got quite emotional at some stages and it's it's quite an emotional thing and yeah i'll just let you listen to it so ladies and gentlemen Lenny and rosie from king's heath and bearwood action for refugees Hello, we're Breaking Bad Podcasts with Carl and Liam, and we're here with Rosie and Leany from Bearwood and Kingsley for Action for Refugees, uh, about to do a podcast. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. So to get started, do you want to start with what the charity do? Yes, so Kingsley Action for Refugees and Bearwood Action for Refugees are a volunteer-led group um, and we do lots of fundraising, um, advocacy, um, and yeah, just generally kind of ra- raising awareness um, of refugees in the local area, but also kind of in Greece um, and kind of further afield. Um, and yeah, we also do sort of befriending projects um, in the local community as well, um, in both uh, Bearwood and King's Heath Action for Refugees, focusing largely around food, actually, mm-hmm. both um, in Bearwood with the community lunches and in King's Heath with their welcome walks. So is there more refugees in them areas than more places in Birmingham? They tend to settle down towards sort of Kings Eve and Bearwood. No, not really. It's just that's this is where we both live. So yeah, you live in Bearwood and I live in Kings Heath. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's kind of how it started really. But yeah, we kind of I mean Kings Heath we work in sort of Sturchley, um and Selly Oak, like we have like a wider area than Kings Heath. Mm. And similarly, yeah, we kind of um, work a lot in Smethwick as well. And we've got quite a lot of partnerships with mm-hmm. Smethwick organisations like um, Brushstrokes and um, and the families that they support there as well. Yeah. Cool. So how did it sort of come about? I think it's the same reasons really, mm. wasn't it? I, I was, I just had my first child and uh, she was about nine months old at the time and I remember the news coming through of Alan Curdy the young boy on the beach who was found dead and I had such a visceral response to it I couldn't I literally couldn't stop crying for about two or three days just couldn't cope I think the hormones obviously were adding to that but yeah and I just kind of felt like I just need to try and do something so I kind of I thought well King's Heath that's the kind of area that would be would have projects that might support but I couldn't find anything. So I just set up a Facebook group and a few people joined and then a few more people joined and then some more. And suddenly there was this big group with lots of people in and we kind of met at Loco Lounge and started talking about what we could do. And it's kind of snowballed from there really. Yeah. And it was really similar in Bearwood. I mean, um, it was initially like a response, as Rosie says, kind of precipitated by the death of Alan Curdy. But, um, we were trying to respond to the crisis in Calais in the jungle at the time. And so we both put calls out on social media um, for like collections in our local area to try and get people just to see if people were engaged. And I mean, I really didn't know whether or not our local community would get behind it or would, you know, be keen to help. And it was just extraordinary, like the amount of the response that we had and the amount of stuff that we collected in that first couple of weeks. It really sort of blew us away, didn't it? And um and yeah, so people definitely did want to help and it was just kind of how best to do that and how to kind of harness it really. Mm-hmm. So I think from there, we um, we kind of did lots of research into sort of different charities working on the ground and what was the best thing to do and whether collecting stuff was the best thing to do. 
and quite quickly found that it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that supporting grassroots projects was through sort of fundraising and that kind of thing. So that's how we started doing that. Yeah. And so, and we kind of did quite a lot of research and found an organization called the Aegean Solidarity Network that we fundraise for still. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and they support, that's exactly um, as Leonie describes, they support sort of grassroots projects. So 100% of the funds that we raise goes to them and 100% of those funds go to supporting those projects Mm. um they kind of specifically focus around yeah projects that are run by volunteers yeah and they've expanded as as we have so originally they started off in just uh the small island of Leros but now they support lots of projects on the islands and also on mainland uh Athens uh mainland Greece in Athens as well so Mm. yeah yeah um, and they're kind of experiencing qu- quite a crisis situation um, at this this end of the year, and um, it's really kind of escalated. So um, yeah, help's kind of needed more than ever. But media attention has really died down. So uh, I think we really see our need to sort of continue to raise awareness really as time goes on. Is this uh, is this your full time job, or do you have other stuff? No. So. I work for a theatre company um, called Women and Theatre based in Moseley who've been around for like 35 years and they do lots of uh, work kind of uh, telling stories of people whose voices are not usually heard. So they have, you know, we've done projects kind of working with refugees and asylum seekers. But we also, Leonie and I, run a community interest company called Mothership which is about sort of advocating and empowering women, uh, particularly mothers and their children. And we work predominantly with um, newly arrived communities. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've been going for about two and a half years now as Mothership, um, doing various different projects, really. So all of the Action for Refugees stuff is voluntary. So we do this on a purely voluntary basis. In our spare time. In our spare time, (laughs) which we have loads. (laughs) (laughs) You kind of touched on it there, but the best way to help and I think that's one of the biggest things that people listening to this like they may want to help but they might not know the best way to help Mm -hmm. would you have any advice for anyone listening yeah definitely I mean um as as I say there's a real crisis situation in Greece at the moment and so um we are constantly mounting fundraising campaigns Mm -hmm. um and appeals for funds for the projects we support there so people can either donate to us Um, or to Aegean Solidarity Network directly. And we also run a number of fundraising events um, throughout the year. And we uh, have a shop, Shop With Love, um, with a number of beautiful products, including our cookbook, um, which would be an excellent thing to buy. And as Rosie said, 100% of the profits go to supporting those refugees. But, you know, if people want to do something more kind of personal and more sort of involve themselves not just giving money then they can volunteer with either of our groups we're always looking for more volunteers to help out at our events but also for befriending for our um monthly projects yeah and i think i think the thing about that question what what can i do a lot of people think oh well i must be a, i must be really good at befriending so that i can talk to people or i must be really good at being able to fundraise so i can raise money but there are other ways. I think that sometimes the best way to look at it is what am I, what's my skill set? What am I really good at doing? And then how can I use that to then facilitate the whole thing in, in a way? So we work with some, and again, the cookbook shows this, but we work with um, some extremely talented people. So Erin Power, who designed the pictures in the book and Brid Rose, who designed the layout. That's where their skills lie. Um, and yeah and they've been able to help us produce this beautiful book that Mm. we're able to sell and raise money definitely and I think also what you were touching on there with the what can I do it's quite interesting because we've got this um campaign at the moment with through Bearwood Action called 36,000 Humans in Action for Refugee Projects and it's uh all about raising awareness of all those who've died in transit because actually it's it's now quite considerably over 36,000 humans who have all died seeking sanctuary in Europe just since since the uh, mid 90s and so you know it's a huge number and our but our hashtag for that one of our hashtags for that project is actually we can because that's the thing there's so many things that people can do to engage with that project and to kind of help raise awareness and try and kind of remember those those people and lobby for um for change really so you touched on there the cookbook which is called this cookbook belongs to us Mm-hmm. So where did the idea for the cookbook come from? As Leonie mentioned at the beginning, most of our sort of fundraiser events have involved food 
<laughs> to some degree, to a large degree, really. Um, so the sort of first event we, the big fundraiser event we did was called Eat and Greet, which we ran at a local church. And we managed to rope loads of local restaurants to come and like b- donate their food. And a chef at Peel and Stone came on the day and we had Real Junk Food Project to donated um uh, p- ingredients and he got into the kitchen and for about four hours just cooked and cooked and cooked uh, which was amazing and yeah we had a sort of team of maybe like five volunteers who'd never necessarily been in a kitchen before and they were a bit like oh okay but we managed to get the food out and everyone said how amazing it was and yeah we raised lots of money and you know that was great and then yeah since then all of the the events we do kind of involve food in some way it's a great way of bringing the community together it's a great leveler we use it with through our befriending projects in terms of um being able to provide someone with a good well-cooked hot meal and yeah there's something really inviting and welcoming about sharing food together it has yeah. a sort of very powerful definitely and impact. i think i think we're really lucky as well here in birmingham that there's um so many kind of great organizations and partnerships to mm. happen around food i mean one of our main well both of our main partners actually is the real junk food project and they donate all the food for our community lunches and that we then it's like ready steady cook we get like a massive box and it kind of arrives in the morning and we're like ah what are we gonna have today you know um which is quite exciting and um we've had a couple of different partners in terms of bread over the years um including um peel and stone and basement bakery in harborne um loaf in your case Mm -hmm. so yeah so um you know we they, they all kind of rally round really and and folks really want to help so this was sort of a way of pulling some of those strings together through the cookbook but also a lot of the projects that um, our fundraising funds out in Greece also center around food so there there's a cooking project but there's also many projects where they kind of provide meals or community uh, kitchen garden yeah um, yeah lots of yeah lots of different ways and also again like within the cookbook each each recipe has a sort of introduction to it and just sort of describing the recipe and why that recipe is so important and what, you know, a story around that. Um, And I think that it sort of reiterates, doesn't it, that wherever you're from, people have a connection to food that can be, yeah, that's really sort of powerful and gives you an identity, um, but also can change and shift as people move around the world even. Yeah, it's quite, it's fascinating to read It is. It is really fascinating. And it also kind of makes you feel closer to the projects we're supporting because a number of the recipes are donated from people who are participants in those projects or have been and so it's kind of it's it's recipes from their home and obviously that's a home that they're not in anymore and it's kind of it's their connection and their memory to their family and their life and it kind of gives you a little window doesn't it really onto kind of what they're what they're feeling Mm. And also just through those kind of smells and tastes and textures, it can take you right back there immediately, you know, without any words. It's it's amazing. And I don't know, I mean, we have the community lunches, we'll often, we kind of all cook together. It's part of it. And so we'll often have folks that, newly arrived folks will come and cook with us and they'll share some of their like dishes. So, you know, we get to have amazing like rice and peas or Turkish rice with the, you know, incredible, the coveted tadug. I don't, I don't know about my pronunciation, but um, the kind of cr- crispy bit from the bottom that everyone sort of fights over mm-hmm. and jollof rice from um, from Africa. And, uh, you know, these amazing things that people want to cook and they want to share with everybody else because, you know, it's, it's from their own from their own culture, mm-hmm. which is really special. Um, so we've both got the book. I've got the book. Liam's got the book. Mm-hmm. I've got Thank the you. Bolty for it. <laughs> no problem. And just as a book, just to read, as you said, the, each one's got an intro mm-hmm. and... They've all got little stories in them. Mm-hmm. It's just, as if, even if you're not going to cook for me, it's a good book just to have, just to mm. flick through and learn from, really. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, so we definitely, the book's fantastic. I really like it. Oh, um, so if people wanted to buy the book, where could they get it from? They can buy it from our website, which is actionforrefugees.org. We also have a number of stockists. We do, yes. So uh, depending on where you live, there's a number of stockists in the city centre, Mm -hmm. Icon Mm -hmm. Art Gallery Shop, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a number of different cafes, Yorks, and um, Wayland's Yard, I think. 
Um, but also, oh, and the clean kilo also stocks it. But yes, if you're in the Bearwood neck of the woods, then uh, Webb's Walled Garden Gift Shop. Um, why not coffee? Mm-hmm. And um, Warley Woods Gift Shop also stocks it. Where have you? So we Armadillo in Kings Heath on Poplar Road stock it, and Loaf stock it also. Although I think they've just sold out, so we need to restock them. Um, yeah, I think that's it currently. Mm. But yeah, through the website, and we um, if people order it um, and they want to do a local sort of pickup, they can collect from Kushu on York Road uh, for cheaper than posting it out by Royal Mail. And if you're really local, I might even put it through your letterbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the price of it, just so people know? It's £12.50. So it's perfect. This is going out just before Christmas, so like a nice yes. little stock and fill if you have a nice... Brilliant. Either someone who cares or somebody who loves food like we do. Uh, we've had lots of people say that people have bought this as a gift for them for Christmas mm. last year. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's lovely. It's a perfect gift, isn't it, really? You know, it helps and it, someone. And it, it does have everything in it as well, from, like, kind of, you know, soup starters, main courses, puddings, you know, it covers everything, baking, it covers yeah. everything. Yeah, breakfast, breakfast there you go, yeah. You only need one book, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but have you got a favourite recipe in it? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yes, I've got two. Is that is that allowed? You can have as many yeah, as you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're very generous. Um, so yeah, the first one is actually probably my children's favourite recipe, and that's the Ghanaian donuts. Oh, they're so good. Um, Everyone's face just went. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, they are very very good. And one of the best things from my point of view about them is that there's only about three ingredients, and they take literally maximum 15 minutes from getting the stuff out the cupboard to make them to eating a donut um which is pretty good and they're delicious so it's a very practical cookbook like at every level of yeah. exactly chef can cook from definitely it. and everything's very straightforward i think as well you know even if it's a more complicated recipe hopefully it's it's straightforward enough for anyone to yeah to definitely and i think we always wanted that because i think it's obviously we, we're creating a cookbook that we want to sell to raise money but we also don't didn't want it to ever be a book that people would buy and then it would just sort of sit on the shelf um and i think because I it's think, a charity because it's a charity book mm. but i think it is a really yeah it's like an everyday cookbook you mm. can pick something and get the ingredients pretty easily and cook it and yeah yeah definitely um so, so your second oh, oh second. yes so my second recipe uh would be chicken tinga so chicken tinga, oh, it's so good. And it's perfect for like leftover roast chicken. Um, and it's really, really delicious. And it's very versatile. So you could have it like with rice or in an enchilada or a fajita type situation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, um, it's really, really delicious. I would highly recommend it. My favorite, I mean, I've got lots. <laughs> um, but if I had to pick one... Um, so before we did this cookbook, if I were to ever make chocolate brownies, I'd always refer to Nigella's cook, uh, brownie recipe. Um, but yeah, since discovering the brownie recipe in here, this is my go-to brownie recipe. It's really good. It's properly simple to make. And the brownies are amazing, like beautiful. So yeah, I think, because I've got a bit of a sweet tooth, I'd mm. say that was my fave. That's a good choice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you said the book 100% of the price of the book goes to charity that's yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, how does that work do, do you just absorb the cost yourself no so no so mm. sorry um there is a small obviously like the yeah. publishing cost printing but cost. um the printing cost but yeah 100% of the profits oh, yeah. um okay, yeah. go to charity yeah. we have been very fortunate to work with emerson's printers yeah. um who have been very generous in helping us print this book and are very good printers, as yes. you can see from the quality of yeah. the book. Yeah, it's yeah. Great um, but uh, yeah, they have they have given us a very, very, very considerable discount. Yeah. Um, in order to do it as They're a donation yeah. to charity themselves, which yeah. is lovely of them. Yeah. We kind of touched on that. You have a couple of shows. Do you want to tell us a bit? Because we kind of the reason we you came to our attention, you were doing was it the. Summer King's Eve, our uh, carnival, events. carnival, yeah, yeah and it, and it yeah. looked awesome. And it just like crept up on us. And I think mm-hmm. I was already, I think it was the Independent Festival the same day. Yeah, yeah. It so was. I was already it was there, weekend. but Carl yeah. went. Um, yeah. I'll pass you on to Carl because 
Yeah, I managed to get down to it. It was, yeah. it, was it was a lot of fun. I took my uh, daughter, and she had a great time. Good. Especially the storytelling. Yeah, the woman you had doing that, she was great. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, so we, so that's our kind of big annual fundraiser, um, and we do that in partnership with um, Highbury Orchard Community. Um, so we kind of take over the orchard in Highbury Park for the day. Um, we have lots of story, as you say, storytelling. Um, we've had art installations, um, music. Um, lots of kind of stalls so we have sort of um, key agencies sort of working in the city so like Birch Network, St. Chad Sanctuary they kind of come so that they can sort of give information and people can find out more about how they can get involved um, and yeah and food <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> um, so yeah it's, it's a lovely day and yeah it's just a really lovely way of kind of getting the community involved and um, lots of kind of family friendly activity yeah is that yearly, that one? Yeah, so annually we run that, yeah, yeah. And what other ones are there people can go to? Um, so we've got a couple of annual events. The kind of key awareness raising sort of community one is our Procession of Light, and that's every October um, in Warley Woods. Um, and so this year's will be the fourth, is the fourth one. Um, and uh, yes, it's basically a torch-lit procession through Warley Woods. It's very beautiful, and it's kind of in solidarity with refugees, um, here and and abroad in transit and similarly we have we have food and uh, we have kind of speakers um, kind of you know rallying people and everybody makes little torch lanterns and we have kind of lantern installations in the um, in the trees as everyone walks and there's singing and this year we've got um, a partnership with Celebrating Sanctuary um, so uh, one of their artists performed and also Writers Without Borders so it's kind of you know kind of an all all encompassing event and then we've got um our retreat also um which happens kind of more springtime early summer and that's in Lightwood's house and it's uh very relaxing it's lots of kind of holistic therapies and um classes like yoga and mindfulness and things like that and folks come along and we do an amazing buffet um, of uh, different, you know, salads and cold type foods and also, you know, rather naughty puddings as well. It's not all kind of sawdust. Um, <laughs> but no, very, very delicious buffet and uh, everyone can just kind of waft about and feel all relaxed. So those are kind of our key annual ones. And then we have other sort of music events um, throughout the year, depending on what's going on. Um, is there anything else that we do that I missed out? Um, well, I know I was just going to say in terms of the, the book and our sort of hashtag shop with love, um, one of the other sort of things that we've done is um, create a, a collection of T-shirts. So we worked with three local designers to produce these designs that we printed on T-shirts, mm -hmm. um, which you can buy from the, uh, the shop. Um, and we've got an exciting collaboration coming up with Punks and Chances. Mm -hmm. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be good. Well, we've both got their T-shirts, haven't we? We've both one each. We have to phone each other up before we go. Make <laughs> yeah, sure that we're both not wearing. Now you can have another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, they're not they're identical, but it's still, we'd still look blue. Yes, yeah, he's oh, perfect. Got That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I think we'd look like Tweedledee and Tweedledee yeah. both wearing at the same time. <laughs> um, so the T-shirts and stuff, where can people get them? You, is that your so, own shop? Yeah, that's the same, same website. The same website, yeah. Action for Refugees. So it's basically your non stop, your non one stop Christmas shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's everything this Christmas. <laughs> How do people keep track? Is it Facebook the easiest way for people to keep track of what's um, coming Facebook, up and what's going on? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Twitter. We're, we're all, we're, we're all there. the social media yeah. platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to know to get, because sometimes, like, the way like refugees are painted in a bad light do you come up across any negativity towards your charity or have you ever seen the bearwood page no <laughs> don't don't check it out i wouldn't um yes we do yes especially with social media being such a like just a cesspit like a lot of the time yeah, yeah. i joined the group and it was i thought it was a food group and then, like, everything was just so, like, f I was like, oh, my gosh, why have I joined? Oh. I was like, I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm gone. Well, I, I was going to promote, like, a podcast because I thought it was, like, a food group. And then it, when it just turned out, everything was, like, just, just I don't want to give it any 
die like, I just <laughs> everything no. was just terrible so I was like I'm, I'm leaving so I think that's the thing you've got to be quite careful where your audience no, yeah. know your audience know your audience a lot of the time yeah I mean in, in sort of response to that because it's something we're aware of um, both of us have worked with Hope Not Hate um, a charity that kind of anti racism charity um and they run a training um workshop called having difficult conversations and that is kind of like an interactive workshop that's based i mean it's great for sort of i sort of really think about it now even if i'm having a difficult conversation it's not about on the bus (laughs) yeah just or with my toddler um (laughs) and it's kind of that it's it's kind of addressing the issue without going in with with the same amount of anger that's being directed towards you and just it basically just gives you loads of tools to actually try and engage someone in that conversation realize that you can't change someone's mind over the course of one conversation Mm -hmm. but if you can start to understand where in a way where they're coming from and this sort of deep rooted part of their identity that makes them have those views then you're sort of one step closer to kind of trying to have that conversation if you see what I mean so it was it's really enlightening it is really enlightening it really yeah no it's 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 really good and it's something that it's a training course that we both run for the local communities as well um to kind of yeah for other people to get more involved in and I think um there's a lot of misinformation out there about the refugee crisis and about yeah kind of wrongfully reported statistics and that kind of thing and the media is incredibly distorted and Mm. so it's not really surprising that people kind of do get the wrong impression but you know we don't take a lot of refugees in comparison to other European countries at all and the majority of that's a fact it's a fact and the majority of refugees go to the developing countries who don't have any money to support them and that's a fact and um it's something that people just don't really understand and it all just becomes all a bit not in my backyard type thing and it's just ridiculous and always the first people to say but what about our homelessness and what about our you know problems they're definitely not the first people who are donating to those to those causes you know but they're usually the same people then in the same breath who would say oh look at all these homeless people why don't they go get a job you know what i mean I don't get it. No, no, exactly. And there's not a limit on giving, you know, just because you donate to one charity doesn't, or, you know, volunteer for them doesn't mean that you can't, yeah, you can't believe in any others. But I think, I think overwhelmingly the response has been really positive and both of our sort of separate groups have really like engaged people and brought people together. And we're always amazed by how many people come to our events, how many people want to help want to offer their time to volunteer and so on so Mm. i think yeah with all the negative there is like huge amounts of positive and we kind of have to hold on to that and kind of yeah harness that i suppose there really is and i mean we also really benefit from the support of so many other organizations within birmingham and smethwick who support refugees and asylum seekers and it's an amazing community actually of organizations who have so much skill and knowledge and you know generosity really in sharing their time and expertise with us and the families and individuals that we work with so yeah it's it's a really it's a good gang it's a good gang (laughs) what's it like for the like new families who come here and then encounter like the charities are they a bit like do they not trust you at first or it varies i think yeah um i think there's often a bit of quite a lot of reticence um because often people have had so many doors slammed in their faces you know they're just kind of expecting the worst um so it can take quite a lot of um yeah convincing sometimes of some people which as we say food can really really help with and yeah it really really does help and I mean I think it's quite different because a lot of the families we work with through the community lunches have been here for some time or are in our community for some time because they're you know housed in temporary accommodation but that turns into quite a long temporary accommodation. Mm. Whereas in Kings Heath, you work with um, families who are about to be dispersed so often. Yeah, that's right. So they will have, I mean, we may meet them at the point where they've only been in the country for a couple of days and actually will only be in the Birmingham area for a couple of weeks, four weeks or tops. So we really kind of meeting people in a way in their most hopeful because they've arrived Mm. and they're here, but actually they're kind of at the start start of a whole load of other can I swear yeah. <laughs> shit <laughs> that, that sort of comes with you know coming to a new country particularly this country mm-hmm. so there's yeah it's a weird sort of I guess yeah sense of hope but also 
yeah they're kind of i think there's like you say with food there's something so powerful about saying come and like eat with us mm. and people want to help and they want to cook with us and they want to tidy up and and do that sort of look a lot of the women we work with in particular mm. want to do the looking after and the cleaning and that's the, what, they, that's that's what, what they, do. they do and actually we don't stop that because that's the sense of empowerment i guess and a mm. sense of control and normality that otherwise they're not definitely not getting and something i mean we've both talked about before is how i think you know we see food as a really good way of like breaking down boundaries and stuff like that but um i think actually it's almost more important in other cultures um and it can be such a kind of yes a, a kind of cultural way of showing hospitality or you know appreciation of somebody else and or welcome and so it can really mean even more to other people than we even anticipate yeah um i mean there's actually a, a quite a good description in the book is of, of this exact thing would it be okay to read it yeah, yeah. would that be all right if i can right, here we go so it's ooh, um it's uh for the recipes for jeresque uh, palau excuse my pronunciation which is rice with barberies um, and it was uh, donated by Mariam from St. Chad's Sanctuary. Um, and she gives a little description of, of kind of what the recipe mean to her, means to her. Um, I remember when I, was, when I was young, every time that my mother made dinner, the whole house would be filled with delightful aromas. The scent of saffron and Iranian spices would fill the entire neighbourhood. According to Iranian culture, when others can smell your food, you need to share the meal with them. Therefore, every time that my mother made dinner, she would give a small portion to the neighbours. Growing up, I loved this tradition and the feeling of community that came along with it. When I first moved to England, I carried on the tradition by giving a small portion of my dinner to my next-door neighbours. At first, they did not welcome the idea and thought of me as a strange person. However, as time passed, my neighbours became more welcoming to this tradition and even began to return my dishes with small cakes or biscuits that they had baked. Now that my neighbours fully understood my culture, every time that I see my neighbour's three-year-old daughter, she'd say in her English accent, Lot fan palo, bedi, make me the Iranian rice. By sharing this recipe, I want you now to experience the same feeling of delight that I felt when I was a little girl. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So it's just it's just really lovely, you know, the kind of feelings that it brings people. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> if, that, if that's not a reason to go and buy the book, I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> one to try the rice, but two, just that story is brilliant. You just got to be ready to share it with your neighbours. So that's a great <laughs> tradition. I'd love that. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how good my uh, neighbour is at cooking. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if toast. I live next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that recipe was collected um, from St. Chad's Sanctuary. And uh, we had quite a lot of recipes from St. Chad's, didn't we? We were really, really fortunate in uh, somebody who really wanted to help. Yeah, so we, when we did our initial call out for recipes, um, this wonderful woman, Cynthia Deason, um, had uh, approached us. So she was a volunteer or is a volunteer at St. Chad's Sanctuary. And she word on the street was that this <laughs> recipe book was happening. And it was something that she'd always wanted to do but just didn't have the sort of woman power or manpower necessarily to kind of make it happen and so when she heard she was like well I've already collected like quite a few recipes um, and I've been working with people as part of their ESOL to uh, you know how to write these recipes out and all the stories and stuff and she was like I really would love to share these with you and she donated very kindly some money towards the printing costs to help us produce this book and she's just a super lovely woman but one of her one of the recipes that she uh, also donated is from her husband who is who wrote I mean the the, the particular recipes in, in memory of Angela Ranicha uh, who was his mother and yeah I just if it's okay I could read yeah, out yeah, the little course, story as well way. my mother came to Britain on one of the last kinder transport trains from Vienna arriving towards the end of February 1939 she was immediately interned to Faversham in Kent but was able to move to Chatham to start training as a nurse in early 1941 one of her patients Fred a first world war veter- veteran was in hospital after a road accident and she married him in September 1941 I came along the next July the first three the first of three sons 
After the war, we were able to travel to Vienna. When I was seven, for us boys, for us boys, this was the first of many happy visits. We stayed with my grandmother, Clara. Clara was one of ten children in a Czech Jewish family. Only she and one brother survived the war. Clara's apple strudel, strudel was Altweiner, old Viennese, and hugely popular. I suspect we asked for it for at least once a week, despite the laborious present, uh, preparation. Clara had to stretch the soft buttery dough over the whole kitchen table, making it so thin that you really could read the paper through it. That took ages. The process is so hard that we have rarely found real apple strudel in any hotel or restaurant, even in Austria. When we were teenagers, every time someone visited Vienna or visited from Vienna, Angela gained a few packets of strudel pastry ready thinned. Eventually, my wife, Cynthia, found that phyllo pastry is as good. That's the basis of this simple recipe, making enough strudel for six hearty helpings. Um, and I just think it's, it's lovely because it's obviously a memory um, of someone. And also, it kind of just highlights really the this isn't the first time this is happening. And it's, I don't know, it just, it's quite a, a sort of powerful rendering i guess of that in 1939 this situation was happening to lots of people and yet here we are in 2019 and it's still happening um yeah and it kind of yeah it's a beautiful lovely tasty recipe but it kind of just yeah it kind of brings that home a little bit doesn't it, it really does. yeah. i'm quite mad because these are stories that you don't really hear like you, other than you that are telling it that there's no national paper telling this or no not even a, a local paper telling this story no. like. No, you're so right. And I think that's the thing. There is a bit of a media distortion. Um, and you don't really hear about these kind of real, real life stories. And I think that's where the 36,000 Humans Project comes in, because that's what we're really trying to highlight, that 36,000 is so many humans, but each one of them was an individual with a family, with aspirations, with hopes, with dreams, um, moving to a better life and um you know going to safety and not getting there mm. and it's it's kind of a way of trying to remember each of those people um but also looking at the number of people that do arrive and actually trying to make situations as as good as possible for them um in memory of those 36,000 as well um yeah so it's kind of a double doubly important yeah. <laughs> You just wonder, you know, when you see on the news, oh, sometimes you see 10 refugees sadly died at sea. I wonder how different it would be if they said, well, these 10 people and then named the 10 people. How exactly. different would people's perceptions be? Yeah. No, I think you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's sad. <laughs> it really is. It's yeah. all about kind of humanising things, isn't it? And I think even just the kind of contrast with looking at that apple strudel recipe and how people now view the war yeah. and refugees from the war and how, you know, that's a period in history that nobody wants to repeat and, you know, everybody has quite strong feelings about and, um, you know, knows a lot about it. They don't equate it with the current refugee crisis at all. They see it as a totally yeah. different thing. Mm. Um, and it's not. As no. Rosie says, it really, it really isn't. I think you've mentioned a few times about uh, lunches that you do. Yes. How often are they? So, yes, the community lunch is once a month. Um, and it is, um, it's specifically for newly arrived uh, families um, living locally in Bearwood. But yes, if anybody wants to come and volunteer with us at those lunches... How's the best way to volunteer? To get in touch with you first on Facebook? Or? Yes, to get in touch with us via our Facebook page would be brilliant. And you'd like people to come down and cook, serve food? Yeah, to cook, to... Um, we have uh, children, lots of children. So there's always kind of children's activities befriending and we can we offer befriending training to our volunteers and then also we have quite a lot of external organizations that come in um different ones each month and might offer like a workshop or a storytelling thing or we or a yoga session um or you know whatever really and uh, if anybody wants to come along and, and do their thing then that would be wonderful too do you find there's a language barrier do you, how do you get around the fact that they might not speak English yes I mean for most of the families we work with English is a second language mm -hmm. but 
for also for most of them they're very very keen to improve their English that's like the most important thing really so actually coming to the community lunch and getting a chance to meet people and chat is really really valuable mm. um, and also the amount of people that come with like random letters they've received or like you know things on their phone that they need translating or you know because they don't understand um, the very complicated English language that unfortunately surrounds almost everything mm. they have to do so you know we're able to try and break it down and simplify things for people a little mm. bit yeah and I mean a couple of our volunteers um, we've got a Spanish speaker and um, an Arabic speaker um, so that kind of helps in the initial because I guess for us what's you mentioned about what's different with welcome walk is that people will have just been in the country and they're probably going to be going in kind of two or three weeks and so our kind of goal really with the welcome walk is just to get them out of the hotel that they're staying in which is a really grim environment for as long as possible <laughs> and yeah just to kind of give that initial kind of welcome uh, and sign post uh, as much as we can but yeah so sometimes sometimes yeah google translate comes in handy um bit of sign language you know signing things that we're going to the park that we're going to be eating food and i think that's the other thing is that yeah people are like really trusting which kind of when i think about it, it makes me want to cry because after everything that you've been through yeah you, they can still take that leap of faith in humanity that the people that because essentially we're knocking on their hotel doors saying come with us um, yeah, it kind of gets me every Whereas, time. Whereas, yeah, really. I think if you've been in the process for a longer amount of time, you'll become less trusting. And a lot of the time when we when we do stuff around trauma and we do training and we look at um, trauma, the amount of examples of actually how people's trauma manifests from their experiences once they've arrived in this country, yeah. let alone what, they've actually, what they're actually fleeing, it's really, really sad. Really, yeah. really sad. The process does not help people at all. No. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's stuff that's got to be said. I know it. We've all just took a big sigh because it's heavy stuff, but it's just stuff you don't hear about. Yeah, it's real. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. You need to come down to a community lunch or welcome yeah. walk. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Yeah, yeah, come have lunch with us. We could do a bit of cooking. That. Yeah, <laughs> be ace. We could definitely cook. That would be ace. Yeah, yeah. That would be brilliant. Awesome. Well, I think that would. We'll wrap up at that point. I think it's been brilliant. Uh, hopefully our listeners will have learned something. And they go and get the cookbook, not just because it's brilliant and they can cook all the delicious recipes, but they will be actually helping. So go and do that. They it's really will be. Pillow. Christmas gift. Go and help someone else. <laughs> and help yourself. Oh, yeah. We've got to thank... Well, I didn't say we've got to Also, thanks to Prince of Wales... Um, massive thank you to them for letting us record here tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you.